Ladies and gentlemen, we are tuned in to the Rico Report. I really don't know what to tell you. That game was insane. Welcome to the Big Squad. Shout out to the Big Squad. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Big Squad. Welcome on a very special evening. To the Rico Report. We are here. He is our team. This is the Buffalo Fanatics. Bing, 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 bing. Ladies and gentlemen, it is your boy Rico back at it again. Welcome back. You are tuned in to the Buffalo Fanatics, and this is the Rico Report. We've got a special show. In the words of my guy z we've got a loaded show for you tonight. Um, I'm very interested in this guest that we've got. Uh, this is um, the creator, the director, the, the mastermind, the master plan. And if you look at this guy, you think he was an evil villain. From from uh, so your your favorite movies, right? Uh, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when he gets here. So um, we will touch on um, a lot of the analytics of uh, of football today. It's changed, right? No more going into a newspaper and reading about a player. Now there is there's the combine, and now there is the RAS, right? The Red Silver Athletic Score. So I mean, there's a lot of things that we're going to touch on. Um, so please uh, help me welcome Mister Creator himself. Ken Steele, how are you, sir? Fantastic. <laughs> we got a how you doing, boss? <laughs> Fantastic, man. Glad to be on. I'm I'm glad you I'm glad you've been able to make it because uh we um short notice, but uh, I'm actually glad because there's a few things that uh we can definitely touch on that I think a lot of Bills fans uh are eager to um to learn more about. And I think you're the individual that we need that will shed some light. Now, um uh, before we even begin, tell us a little bit about yourself on uh, what you're up to, uh, what you've created, um, and how it's affecting fans all over, I mean, the globe right now. Yeah, I've been I've been covering the NFL now for almost a decade. Uh, I, I live in Michigan. I've been a Detroit Lions fan for much of my life, so a lot of my football writing started very Lions-centric. Uh, back in 2013, I developed the relative athletic scores, which um, is a bit bigger now. Um, it started out just as a way to, to try to look at uh, athletic testing in a better fan centric way. You know, a lot of the information that we get is all just it's just, you know, little little earwigs that they give you like, oh, this guy is, is quick, but not fast. This guy is explosive. Um, you know, he's he's, uh, you know or agile and all these words that they don't really mean anything without any real context. And then even if you started to get into the NFL, you start getting the metrics and you start saying, Oh yeah, that guy ran a, a four or five. Is that, is that good? I mean, it, it's probably good. It sounds good, right? You know, I couldn't run a four or five if I tried, um, but it, it, it helps give a little bit of that context. So fans can, can get a better idea of what this stuff actually means and provide some of that, um, that information about whether this stuff is meaningful or not. Um, and it's, it's picked up in the last couple of years and I'm glad it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've enjoyed doing it. Um, I run my own website now. Um, it's specifically devoted to, to athletic testing and covering yep. all these metrics. Um, and then on top of that, I work for uh, pro football network as their uh, applications development and one of their, uh, analytics. Um, I build tools and things. I'm sure you've went over and looked at the, the mock draft simulator they have. I didn't build that. You um, did. I, I didn't, I didn't build it. Okay. Uh, I, I maintain it though. I maintain okay. all the stuff that you goes keep, along You keep with it running. You keep it running smooth. Yep. yep. And I'm adding, going to be adding more things to it to try to keep us ahead of, you know, the, the competition that we got out there. Um, but those are the big things that I'm into now, man. It's just, it's just covering the draft from an analytics standpoint and, and talking about prospects and looking at how all this stuff meshes with the math and then just putting together some applications that people enjoy. So the, the, draft simulator if you will you keep it afloat and you keep it smooth uh are do you have anything to do with uh where players tend to trend and how the 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 i guess the analytics change right so if for instance 
Um, uh, Kyle Pitts, uh, for some reason, I don't know, he gets in uh he gets in trouble for whatever reason. Now, do do you mess with that to drop him in the or that has nothing to do with you? Oh yeah. I'm I mean I'm I'm not I'm not the sole guy behind all the rankings. I'm not sitting here and just deciding where all these guys go. I ain't got the time to watch all these guys, 100, 100 million hours of tape on 400 plus players. I ain't got yeah. time for that. We have a team that does all that stuff. Awesome. Um, I'm the guy that presses the buttons and flips the switches and makes sure everything goes where it needs to go. You know, if, if we have a guy that, that we don't expect to fall a certain amount of, of distance, you know, we don't expect this guy to fall outside of the top 10. I'm the guy that makes sure that doesn't happen um, without being unrealistic. We don't want to just lock in all these picks because then it's not fun. It's it's not an enjoyable simulator and it's not a realistic simulation if you do that because you're just saying, hey, these are the picks that we decided yeah. are going to yeah. go here and that's just the way it is. That's no fun. The, so, you know, and, 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 and I'm with, and I'm with you and I'm, I'm, I have to jump on this because you are a numbers guy. Oh. I am not. I've never <laughs> been, never will. Anytime someone tries to try to get me, I, I have to really focus and like, hey, give it to me again, give it to me again. And I have no, no qualms about admitting that. But there are those that are really on your page. And shout out to my guy, John DeMarchi. I got to give a belt to my guy, John DeMarchi. He goes, hey, I have an RAS score of, a z of 0, 0.00, but I am a card carrying nerd and was a hell of a mathlete. Real word is my day. So this donate, this is donated to Rico and the math. Also, Justin Zimmer had a score of a, a score of 10. You called it. He's saying you called it. Do you yeah. I, and and I may I gave you a few players to look at. Um, does the name Justin Zimmer ring a bell? Does, do you remember oh, that yeah. name? Yeah, I know his parents. Yeah. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's, he's uh, right. He was a he was a big dude around here. So he's 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 from here. So he's uh he was a big name when he was coming out just because he was so athletic and he had so many tools. Teams just didn't really know what to do with him. So they 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 tried him on defensive tackle, they tried him on a fullback. Uh he held on to that 10 Raz for for quite a while. I don't think he has it anymore. I think he got picked up by uh, Christian Sicoli. Um but yeah, he held on to that 10 spot for a little while. It, it's got to be it's got to be crazy uh to be the the person that comes up with these because I I have to listen and I mean this with no disrespect Mr. Math Bomb, okay? Because there are folks that are are saying, you know what? Who in the heck does he think he is? <laughs> Never played a. I mean, have you played football? Let me just put that out there. Not since high school. No. Not since high school. All right. Never played any D one football. Never played any JUCO football. N no level of high competitive play. But this guy behind his computer with his smooth mustache, might I add, right, is evaluating <laughs> us that put the hard work, the blood, the tears, and he's gonna give me a RAS score of two point seven. What does he know? How do you answer that? How do you answer that? Because I'm sure you do. I do. And I, and I get players that get real mad about their scores when they get low scores. And I, I had a guy this year who he scored like a 989, some ridiculously high number. And he was mad he didn't get higher. He, he thought that he deserved a higher score than that. Um, it, it comes up every now and again. And, and I just got to remind people that like these aren't these aren't my numbers. I'm not I'm not coming up with these scores off the top of my head. Um, and just deciding this is where I have determined your score to be. Um, it, it's all comparative. It's all relative to the, the player's position group over a period of about 35 years now. So, you know, it's, it's, it's fun when you get those arguments. The, pe the people that don't care for the numbers, they, they can find those arguments. And I know because I can find them faster and better, right? If I, right, right, right. If I wanted to disprove my metric, I could find so many guys so fast. You got Antonio Brown, Anquan Bolden, Wes Welker, S3 just right there, at wide receiver. I can keep going. You know, it's, it's easy to find guys that fit that notion that you have that they don't matter. But when you look at the, 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 the data from a, a, a whole picture approach, and it's like, yeah, I can find those guys, but I can find you three or four or five guys at the same position who, right. scored, who scored way better and had similar levels of success. So it's it's not a matter of whether something is possible because Jarvis Landry exists. So I don't care how bad you test, you're never going to test as bad as Jarvis Landry did and become successful in the NFL. What what was what was Jarvis Landry's score? Uh, zero point two seven out of ten. <laughs> he remembers. Uh, oh yeah, uh, it's my favorite one. It's my favorite card, man, because it's so bad. Um, I put together a, a top, a, a, like a, a Frankenstein's monster of best 
receivers uh, based on like the best pro bowlers and thousand yard receivers, whoever tested the best. And I picked the best speed, the best vert, the best broad, all that stuff to create this Frankenstein's monster. I did the same thing for the worst good receivers, the, the right. worst receivers who did well. And five out of the 10 metrics were Jarvis Landry. So, you know, <laughs> no kidding, but it's, it, it's, it's easy to find those things. Just like it's easy to find guys who tested well and then busted. But when you look at the whole numbers, when you look at everything as, as one large picture, that trend stands out so much and it's impossible to ignore because regardless of what I've used as a metric for success, it always comes out to almost the exact same percentages of guys who found success and tested as elite athletes versus guys that found success and didn't test as elite athletes. And again, it's not a matter of whether some guy can be successful. It's likely that the chances that you're going to hit on a guy, because that's what you're looking for in the draft. So uh, I've got uh, John Amarchi is in his, he's in, he's in a great mood right now because he he's found his long, his long lost brother in the math leagues. He says <laughs> math bomb is 3.14159 times better than the scouts. He get that joke. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a cake guy either. I, I prefer the other dessert. <laughs> <laughs> See, that, that's what you think. So um, here, so I, I've got some I've got more questions, right? Because you mentioned Jarvis Landry. Um, has there been um, other than Jarvis Landry cases where you're you're like this person charted like off the charts? He's amazing. But and sorry, let me rephrase that because. In my mind, I've got so many questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come with this one. Somebody asked me, "What exactly does it mean when you are you score a nine out of ten? What exactly does it mean?" Because I've had someone say that that's a ninety percent chance that you're going to be successful in the NFL. Is that what that means? No, and you should never look at it that way. We're we're okay. always looking at this. And mind you, I'm the guy that created this system. Yes. So if I'm telling you, <laughs> don't take it as gospel. There is no better authority on this. Um, you know, it's, you always have to take it as a piece of the picture. You know, there's, there's so many different things that go into being a successful NFL player that you can't take one thing and be like, that is the only thing that matters. Nothing else matters at all. Um, there's, there's just so much that goes into it. Uh, it's the same thing with, you can't ignore it completely. If you have a guy that you love on tape, but he scores like absolute garbage, you can't ignore it. Um, and the NFL doesn't, the NFL is not going to ignore because they know that guys who test poorly tend to bust out fast and hard in the NFL. Um, if a guy doesn't test well, it doesn't mean he's a bad player. Sometimes they just win in a different way. Um, I mentioned a couple guys earlier. Jarvis Landry was hurt, so I'm, I'm kind of cheating using him because he had a hamstring injury when he tested. He right. also he also tested bad at his pro day, but, he like, did. No, but like normal bad, like regular bad, um, not obscene bad. Um, but I always like to use the example of Anquan Bolden just because Bolden was such a popular player for so long. He's a very right. easy name to come to mind. But Anquan Bolden wasn't fast, and he no. wasn't even particularly that explosive. But he, he was smart enough to know how to box guys out. He had a great wingspan, and he was so good at getting the ball in his hands in the air because he was so physical. When the ball was in the air, you had to fight Anquan Bolden for that ball, and he was usually going to win. And that's not testable. That's not something that we put in those tests. Um, I, I'm thankful that we've had another hit in the recent years that gives me an even better example because Orlando Brown tested okay. ob obscenely terrible for an offensive tackle. And it's why he went in the third round and not in the first round like he was projected at the time. You know, and it was just really, really bad. But Orlando Brown said it himself. He explained it. I didn't have to go through the trouble of trying to figure it out on tape because he explained it all in an interview. He talked about, look, I'm not, I'm not a big fast, I'm not a speed guy. I'm not going to wow you with being able to, to pull on the edge and stuff. But, but I, I understand what these guys are going to do. So it's north of the neckline, right? It's mental stuff. But his length is so good. He has these big, long arms and a broad wingspan. And he's like, I, I understand what these guys are going to do and where they're going to be. And I make sure that at least one of my arms is going to be there. Right. Um, and and he, he's just so good at understanding how to use his length to beat defenders. And that's not a common trait. You know, you've got guys that have big arms who don't know what the heck to do with them. And it's, it's just that combination of things helps overcome not having those athletic traits. In addition to working in a scheme where it's not asked of him, you know, if, if he went to a team that was like, look, we're going to put you on the edge and we're going to pull you to the other side every other play. Right. He, he wouldn't have done well because that's just not his game. You know, um, scheme plays a part of it. The team understood it and they, they, they used him how he knew how he could be used. 
and he was successful because of it. So never take any individual test, even a, even a composite one like Raz, as gospel, as, as the only thing that you need to evaluate. Um, it's just a piece of the puzzle, and it's your job to figure out how important that piece is. It, and it and it's and it's it's crazy because uh, for for someone that's created this, you you must hear, see all the criticism uh, coming towards your system, um, and you you almost can't take it personally. It's just guys, this is what it is. It's, these are the metrics, and here are the results. And guess what? Sometimes I'm more right than wrong. So. I'll, I'll take it with a grain of salt, right? Um, so Bills fans have questions. Um, our prize possession, our prize star, our franchise quarterback is Josh Allen. Um, how did J Josh Allen score and how you're seeing it translate to the field, right? It's been a slow progression, and then he just took off last year. Uh what what is it that stands out for you from what he scored and how he's progressed right now? Yeah, Josh Allen's funny to me because I, I I have three Josh Allens in my database. I have a, a guard from some years back. Of course, we had the pass rusher a year or two ago, and then Josh Allen, the quarterback. And all three of them were like god tier athletes. All, all three of them were great athletes. So if you got a guy coming out in the draft and his name is Josh Allen, good chances he's a great athlete. <laughs> <You'd be> good. <laughs> um, I mentioned before, you know, there's a lot of things that don't get tested when we're looking at these metrics and quarterback is the easiest position to point to. There's so many things that don't go into athletic testing that makes a quarterback successful. You know, arm strength is a huge deal. Josh Allen has probably the best, if not the best, the second best arm in the NFL, depending on who you ask, but no worse than second best. That's not measured in any test that we have. And the only test we use to measure that is the radar gun at the combine. And that's a horrible way to test that. Um, you know, he's, he's a great athlete on the football field. He moves really well. Um, he's fast. He's big. He's got all those athletic traits you want. And you see that when Josh Allen is playing, he moves really well. When he's on the run, he's a bear to take down. He's smart and quick with his feet. All of that stuff showed up on tape going all the way back to college. It, it's always been there. He tested exactly how he looked like he should have tested, right? Great athlete. Um, all those other things, you know, the, the, accuracy, the ability to read defenses, that's not covered in a metric like this. And you can't really take a metric like this to, to show this guy is going to be a great quarterback unless you're just talking about the mobility portion. If you're talking about how mobile a guy is and how well they can move, by all means, this is a good way to start. You, you're, you're, you can look at some of the things that they do. Um, I tend to think that the three cone is a little bit more representative of how a player a quarterback runs than okay. the 40-yard dash. Uh, just because you're in a pocket, Jerry, you're maneuvering around a pocket rather than just taking off and running. Um, Josh Allen did great there. He's, he ran a 6'9 at 237 pounds, which is crazy regardless of the position. Um, but you don't get a lot of quarterbacks that that measure that way. And he did fantastic. Um, Josh Allen's in, an easy eval from an athletic standpoint because he had, he tested pretty much exactly how he looks on tape. Now, I'm, I'm, this is off the cuff right now because uh, I just happened to be – so months ago, um, maybe a couple months, three months ago, Nick Wright um was um was on TV and he was he was talking about uh, quarterback Deshaun Watson and um and how there there's there was trade talk and every team should be interested in trading for Deshaun Watson, right? Uh, and I had my opinion that I felt that Deshaun Watson uh, in the moment right now is better than Josh Allen, minuscule or not. I just feel he's the better quarterback. Doesn't take away from me loving Josh Allen. So. Do you, what was the rat and and this is off the cuff, so you might have to look it. But what was the RAS score for for uh, Deshaun Watson? Uh, because I remember him coming out of college, um, not a super athlete, but athletic enough that he could do all the great things that you see him doing on the field now. Yeah, and he's way more athletic than he, than he got a chance to showcase when he was at Clemson. He tested really well. He had a 9.24 out of 10, which is okay. a, little, a little bit south of what Josh Allen had. And a lot right. of that's because he's smaller than Josh Allen. He ran a better 40-yard dash. Uh, he had a better shuttle time. He had a lot of better tests than Josh Allen did. But he's also significantly smaller than Josh Allen. Right. Um, so he got a little bit of a lower score, but he still had a 9.24. Um, he's also a really good example. I mentioned just a minute ago how you shouldn't really trust the radar gun at the combine because it's not yep. a great way to measure that. Um, Deshaun Watson measured horribly for arm strength at the combine. Mm. He, had, he had one of the worst um, 
MPH for a passer in some some odd year, some ridiculous amount of time that he had the worst worst score. So it's it's just one of those things where like a football field is 300 yards, a mile is 5,280 feet. These aren't comparable measurements that you can look at and say these are these are close enough that we can we can measure those together. You know, it's it's a little different when you're looking at stuff that that far apart. But uh, it, it, Watson it, measured he measured really good. I, I think if, I think he was a little hurt coming out too, um, so that might have impacted it a little bit. But he tested really well. So now. Sticking to the Bills right now, um, we've got some players where uh, I know some of my my colleagues and and some of my my peers are asking about the scores of and and how it's translated with Matt Milano, our linebacker, uh, recently signed Matt Milano. Uh, how did he score in the RAS? Matt Milano scored fine. Um, he didn't score an elite score. Anything anything above or below five is considered below average. It's a zero to ten scale, so that makes sense, right? Anything yep. below five is below average. Um, for, for my scale, I found that anything above eight is when you get into that probably going to have a better chance of success range. So um, I usually color code stuff accordingly. Anything right. above eight is green. Anything below five is red. Everything in between is yellow. Um, and that's kind of where Matt Milano fell. He had a 6.95 out of 10. Um, he's small for a linebacker. When he came out, he was only uh, six foot and a half inch and 223 pounds. Mm-hmm. That's small, even even in today's day and age where linebackers are getting smaller. That's that's small. Um, and he was, he was a tweener, right? He was coming. He was yeah. a safety going into linebacker, so he's in between right. that. So that small stature, I understand. Yeah, which is getting more common. Uh, but he was small for for then. Um, so he's he's a little small. I don't know what he's playing at right now, but he ran a four six seven, which is good, not great, but good for a linebacker. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he had really good explosion scores. His his uh, a ten six broad is ninety fifth percentile. That's a really good broad jump. And you want your linebackers to be explosive. So right. he's got good speed and he's explosive. Those are the two most important things for for linebackers. So it's it's good to have those type of traits, even if he's a little bit smaller. In in your opinion, what would you say is the, the most underrated combine um, combine activity? The the combine drill would you say is underrated and most people should focus on that. What do you, what do you think is the, the most important? So it depends, on the, it depends on the position. And I, and I always, I always love talking about this because it's, it's, it's one of those things where some of them are like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. And some of them are like, why that doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, we talk about pass rushers. You're always going to hear about the three cone because you want a guy that has a sub seven cone, right? Those those bendy guys that can really dig around the edge. Um, that's always going to be the most common one that you hear about for pass rushers for offensive linemen. It's the shuttle. You know, offensive linemen that have a 4-4 shuttle or better, regardless of which round that they're picked in, they have a better chance to start in the NFL, even if they're picked in the sixth, seventh round. So those are those two magic numbers, is the, the, the low, low shuttle for uh, an offensive lineman and a low cone for a pass rusher. Uh, but one of my favorite ones is, is uh, the 40-yard dash for offensive linemen. Yeah, you always okay. hear, what, when is an offensive lineman going to run 40 yards in a straight line? Not hardly ever. but if you're looking at the drills that, you know, cookie cutter, that, that the, the drill is only showing something that's going to absolutely be used on a football field, you're evaluating the drills incorrectly. You're not looking at the drills in the right way. You know, a, a vertical isn't just a test of how, how high guy can jump. It's, it's a matter of how explosive a guy is, how much he can propel his weight upward. That's a skill that's used at almost every position, even quarterback at times. You know, the broad jump is, you know, how many times are they going to jump in a straight line standing still? Almost never, but offensive linemen are going to go from a stance to pushing a guy forward immediately, and defensive linemen are going to counter that. On the outside, you got wide receivers and corners who are trying to beat press. So even though they're not doing that exact action, they're doing something that translates using those athletic traits. The 40-yard dash has a bad rap for us in offensive linemen because it's very hard to imagine when that's useful. Uh, but it's also one of the most correlated individual drills for an offensive lineman, uh, more than the shuttle, more than the 10 yard split, although only like barely. And it's, it's one of those things where you're not looking at whether or not they can run in straight line fast. You're talking about guys that are 320, 330, 340 pounds, right. huge guys. If they can get up to speed fast and maintain that speed over a distance, that's more than just, oh, he can run in a straight line fast. That's showing that he's a big guy that can explode out of a stance and get up to full speed very quickly, and he's got the endurance to maintain it over a distance. 
that's that's getting a little deep in, into how the numbers work and trying to, it, it's not just like trying to over evaluate it, but that's that's what you're looking to when you're looking at the drills. It's not just, are they gonna do this exact thing? It's, are they gonna use this type of athletic trait on a football field? And it gets overlooked a lot for offensive linemen that 40 yard dash. You know, if, if you're a big power blocker, 40 yard dash probably isn't gonna matter, not just because you're not gonna run in 40 yards in a straight line, but in a power blocking scheme, that trait isn't as useful. It's not as useful as being able to blow a guy off the stance of the, for the first couple of yards. Way mm -hmm. more important in a man blocking scheme than say a zone blocking scheme where you're gonna be on the move quite a bit often. and You've gotta be able to get up to speed fast and cover a good distance and have the endurance to do that play after play. This, this is so interesting because I, I'm I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm, I'm I wasn't mesmerized, but I'm like, I'm so in, Throw what you're saying because like your vertical, your broad jump, uh, you don't, I mean, you know, it's there for explosion, but who is it important for? Right. Um, so that's what uh, that stands out to me where you're like, okay, your lineman, how quickly can he get out of his jump and get explosive? So now I'm looking at broad. Now I'm going to be looking at broad jump. Hey, how did uh, the lineman that we potentially draft do in the RAS report? So that is something that I'm very interested in. Uh, you know what? After you drop such a bomb like that, you should just, this should be your thing when you say something and then you drop a start curling. Mic. No more mic drop. Oh, actually, it's just this. I got, I got the, I got the comb out. I can start, start, start doing that while I'm doing it. Just uh, all casual. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by Mr. Kent uh, Platt um, with the uh, the the creator director of the Raj Report. Thank you very much. Um, and um, what a, what a joy it is to have you. Um, I've got a question from Don, John DeMarchi. He goes, uh, real question here. He says, data shows that after first three rounds, betting on elite raw athletes pays off two to three times versus the blah athletes. If the RAS equals GM, how would the play draft, right? How would you yeah. play the And he's not wrong. If you're looking at it across all positions, that's that's totally correct. You, you want to bank on your better athletes outside of the first couple of rounds. And it's important to note outside of the first couple of rounds, because in your first three rounds, you're almost always looking at the best athletes anyway. Um, the guys that test poorly and go in the first three rounds, they bust at a higher rate than guys who test well and go in the first three rounds. Guys that test well and get drafted in the first three rounds hit at a higher rate than guys who don't test well. You know, it's the guys that you get drafted, the guys that get drafted in those first three rounds, part of why they're getting drafted is because they're better athletes, right. because they have those athletic traits. So it's not a hundred, it's not a cause and effect thing. It's correlated. It all, it all connects. It doesn't, one thing doesn't necessarily lead to the other. Um, I like it. But yeah, you, depending on the position, you really want to start to look at some of those things. A pass rusher, it's very rare that you get an unathletic pass rusher who finds success in the NFL. We've had a couple uh, in the last few years. The Lions just re-signed Romeo Aquara, who was a, a really good pass rusher at the end of the year, the year last year. Um, even though he had good stats, he wasn't really that good of a pass rusher before that. Um, but he didn't test well. He was also an undrafted free agent. And there's a lot of undrafted free agents who don't Absolutely. test well. Absolutely. So, it's you're not looking at did he hit and test poorly. You're also looking at what's the value of that guy because we're looking at it from the draft standpoint, right? Um, and then uh, cornerback is one of my favorite ones because cornerback outside of the first three rounds doesn't really matter how well you test. So it's kind of a, a I tend to weigh the tape a lot heavier for cornerbacks outside of the first three rounds because the data tells me to, it, it tells me if you're, if you got really good tape and, and you get drafted in the later rounds, the testing doesn't matter all that much. In the first couple of rounds, the testing matters way more, but outside of that, I don't really care quite as much. And then uh, another one of my favorites is the, the center position. Um, even in the first three rounds, I, I don't care. It, it don't matter. I, I love, I love my metrics and I love being able to say, I, you know, this, this guy, these, you know, they hit the pro bowl in this much, they have this many starts and yada, yada, yada. But, that don't exist for center. So I, I can't honestly sit there and say, oh, yeah, every position, every single one. I, I always point out every position except center, and I don't know why. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I have a theory that sounds really good, which is that uh, it's a more cerebral position. You know, they're, they're paying attention to the line calls. They have to know all the defensive fronts. They have to be able to point everybody out. It's a much more mental position. And that, that helps me make up for the fact that my data has no correlation whatsoever. <laughs> so so hold that thought because we're, we're speaking on the center position. But before we get to the center position, my guy, Steve Judge Mathis, Mr. Snarky himself, 
asks, what about Jason Owe's athleticism versus production? Where do you land on him? Yeah, so Jason Owe is a stupid tier athlete. Um, he ran a 4-3-6, I think it was, at his pro day at defensive end, which is right. absurd. Um, and it, that, that was a big deal when it happened for a lot of casual fans because you never see that, and you know that a 4-3 is good. So even if you don't have all the contextualized stuff that I have, you know that's really, really good. Um, but we've also been calling it for several months now that Jason O was going to run a sub 4-4 at his pro day, and, and then he did. Um, weighing against production is really tough, especially at pass rusher, because there aren't a lot of, of uh, unproductive pass rushers who find success in the NFL, just like there aren't a lot of poor athletes that find success in the NFL. Uh, but we do have a few examples. Daniil Hunter was a guy whose who's tape didn't warrant an early selection whose uh, actual production in college didn't warrant an early selection, but his athletic tools were fantastic. There was a lot to mold there. Right. Uh, and, and Jason Noah kind of falls into that same, same realm is, is you have a guy who's so athletic and has such great traits. The question doesn't become uh, if you're going to draft him because you want that guy on your football team. If you're a coach, you think you can do something with it, right? The question is what kind of fit – does your team present for him? And does your team have a position they can put it, him in to succeed? Do they have the coaching staff to put him in to succeed? Is, is there a Mike Zimmer on your team that can help, help develop that talent? Um, and then it becomes a question not of evaluation, but of valuation. What, what do you pay for that? What do, you, what do you give up in terms of resources to get a guy with those kind of talents? Um, so that's that's where you really start to weigh those type of things. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the math bomb himself. Uh, here joining us today, um, dropping nuggets. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I mean, we've got people in the chat that have got crazy questions right now, and I'm and I promise you guys, I'm scouring while I'm listening, and I'll be able to try to jump back. But if you want your questions to be heard and seen, you guys know what to do. Uh, hit that super chat, and we'll get you going. Um, so Kent, we uh, in in our in our in our our Twitter chat, uh, we wanted to touch on certain players um, that the Bills have drafted. Um, and I wanted to get your, your thoughts on them. So, um, let's start off with, actually, let's start off with this. Let's start off with the 2018 draft class. All right. Now, was there a player in that draft class that stood out to you where you're like, Ooh, now that is interesting on how this player scored in the RAS report. And I keep calling it the RAS report, but the RAS score, um, and how he has transited to the field. So looking at this 18 draft, we had, obviously we spoke on Josh Allen. And then, uh, then we had Tremaine Edmonds. Now, that's an interesting one. Talk to us on Tremaine Edmonds. This is another guy that, that you really got to look not just at the numbers, but the overall picture, because Edmonds blew up in terms of athleticism on tape, but he didn't, he didn't do all of his tests. Um, he only did a couple of the tests. He skipped out on his, on his agility drills, which some people consider that a red flag if a guy doesn't test his agilities, um, because a lot of guys don't test it because they know they're going to do poorly. Uh, I don't think that was the case with Edmonds. And at, at his size, at, at over 250, you don't get a lot of fast linebackers. You get a lot of linebackers who are explosive, that have that explosiveness, but they're not necessarily fast. Edmonds is both explosive and fast on tape. Uh, and he's also extremely young, which is part of why he was such a well-considered prospect. Right. Um, but he, his biggest knock at the time was that he didn't put up a very good bench. And I, I always love the bench argument because it's it's not the most useful metric for for athletic testing in general but it's so dependent on a player's arm length and, and how long their arms are uh, and Tremaine Edmonds has 34 and a half inch arms which is really long for a linebacker most linebackers are in that 32 maybe 33 range so he's got an extra you know three inches of length that he's got to deal with and he didn't put up a very good bench press. He only had 19 on the bench. And that was that was a thing at the time. And it always makes me laugh because I don't I don't care if his arms are that long. Yeah, that's that's a really good number to put up. Um, but Evans was a fantastic prospect. He had a 9.74 out of 10. Okay. Um, that 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 ridiculous speed that he puts up. I mean, you guys, you've seen it. You've seen how much that shows up on tape. Yep. Um, once once he started putting things together, and I, I personally think he was a much more polished prospect on tape in college than a lot of people gave him credit for. A lot of people use that age as an excuse to, to say he was inexperienced on the field or raw. Um, he had a lot of that stuff already put together, but once he was a pro and he started putting even more of that stuff together, he really started to flash, and, and you guys have seen that. Kyle, 
kind of so now I, I'm 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 looking in the chat right now, and you're getting a lot of love, my friend. This guy is effing smart. <laughs> All right. So uh, lots of love coming from your uh, coming your way, Kendall Mursky, one of our our contributors. Uh, this is why it's called the relative athletic score. Everything needs context, and when evaluating, Math Bomb is on fire, my friend. You're on fuego. All right. <laughs> so when looking at this, I'm going to continue to look at this this 18 draft class. Then you had a guy like Harrison Phillips, right? And then I want to jump down, and, and I want you to hit on Harrison Phillips. And then one really interesting one is Wyatt Teller. Because what Wyatt is doing now got some fans saying, damn, we shouldn't have got rid of him, right? <laughs> so Harrison Phillips. Harrison Phillips was uh, an interesting case because he tested way better than people expected him to. A lot of people expect him to test a lot more like a nose tackle. Um, because he's, he's just kind of played like that, even though he wasn't as big, he wasn't your 330 pound hulking monster of a nose tackle. He was known more as a, a run, a run defender rather than a pass block, a pass rusher. And he didn't test like that. I mean, he put up 42 reps on the bench, which is crazy, crazy. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. Good. Um, but again, arm length, he doesn't have short arms. A lot of guys that put up those, those 40 plus. Those guys have like 31 inch arms. They're, they're on easy mode. They're only going right. like this far, you know, right. he, he had almost 34 inch arms and he put up 42 on the, on the bench. That's nuts. So for context, that's, that's 9.92. That's a 99th percentile bench press. There's only a couple guys that have ever done better at defensive tackle. Um, that's fantastic. Um, and again, this wasn't a guy that was expected to test all that well, but his agility numbers were really, really good. Um, his speed wasn't. And, and I think a lot of people knew that was going to happen, but his agilities were fantastic for uh, an interior lineman. So that's that's the type of player that you want to want to pick up if you're looking for a guy who might have that upside as an interior penetrator, a guy that you can use to kind of break up the inside to really quickly get around guys, maybe even play on the edge in some in some different formations, um, not just a speed guy, but to do some stunts or to do some kind of trick or, trick, or, uh, trick plays where you're moving guys around or doing an overload blitz. You want to get those guys that have a little bit of movement speed and have good footwork to do those sorts of things. That's the type of upside you're looking at with a guy with that kind of profile. That is amazing. Now, kind of cut, you kind of cut out a little bit. I want to get that last part oh. you just said there. Oh yeah. Sorry. I was just saying that's, that's what you kind of look for for a guy that you want to develop. And that interior pass rushing role is somebody with those types of traits. Cause you can use them all over. Okay, perfect. This is a perfect segue because I'm a new school GM. All right. I'm a new school GM. Um, and I'm not like the old school gettleman that's got a big old binder that he goes through and does all that stuff. I'm new school. And if can I rely on the 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 Raz over Combine, right? So the combines are great. You got you've got everything I need from the combine. So now I'm looking at your your scores and i'm like you know what i don't have to worry about looking at the combat i just go to my friend's score and look at who's there and then go from there are your evaluations and your analytics strong enough that nfl teams i mean obviously they're coming calling to you so can they use your system um and and rely on it is there validity in your system where they can say you know what i'm going with that combine is great i'll send my my assistants there but i'm paying attention to kent's report what do you say on that yeah, NFL teams, they they they've all like you said, you got guys that have been in this in this game for decades. They've got binders full of this stuff and they've been doing it for so long. Every NFL team, one of the things I always like to point out is that every NFL team has some kind of internal metric that's similar to Reds. Not necessarily the same type of calculation. It might not be a relative metric like mine is, it's because mine was invented to be fan facing. Mine was invented to give context to people who don't necessarily understand this stuff just by looking at it. It's meant to provide an easy way to understand what these numbers mean in the context of their position and when they were drafted. Um, NFL teams have been doing this for a long time. Some of these guys longer than the combine has even existed. The combine's only been around since 1985. So they have their own metrics. What's been fun with Raz is seeing that some teams, their metrics have to be very similar. <laughs> very, very, very similar. And somebody just mentioned it. I'm working on getting a monocle. I, I wear glasses, so I need to get a monocle. Nice. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, the the Packers always get brought up because you know Brian Gutenkurst is is very 
very notorious for taking super athletes, guys with top tier athleticism. So my metric's been a little bit more popular with Packers fans because it tends to fall in line with the guys that their team interviews at the combine, yeah. the, guys, okay. the guys whose pro days that they're looking into, the guys they ultimately draft. Um, the Colts have been another good example because the Colts, their analytics have been very wired in for years. They've got a really strong analytics team. Um, and they've always been a really good job of finding those those elite tier type of athletes. Um, so there's there's every team has something like that. And, and my mine is it's free. Anybody can go out and look at it. So, I mean, if they want to, they can, they're welcome to it. Hell, I'll download it and give it to them. If the team asks me for it. Um, but there's there's a lot more inside the numbers that that NFL teams start to look into. My stuff's right. great. My stuff's great for people who don't understand the context or who are just getting into it or old dogs who just find it useful because it, it does have some correlation to it. Um, but you're going to find teams that have interesting ways of looking at it and different ways of looking at it. Uh, the Lions' new general manager, Brad Holmes, one of the things he was famous for when he was with the LA Rams was his ability to evaluate safeties. Right. And he would find guys that have, uh, I've started referring to it as typing because you have, you know, nickelbacks is different than a boundary corner. Slot receiver is different than an outside corner or receiver, you know. So it's, there's typing in individual positions. And Holmes found one of those types and he would found a really great way to balance that evaluation aspect and evaluation where he wasn't drafting guys super high. But he was finding really good players because they didn't test all that well. They would run a poor, a poor 40 yard dash, like a 462, 465, and then just get written off. A lot of teams would just be like, yeah, well, we're not going to get him in the third round. You know, we'll let him fall to day three. And Brad Holmes would swoop up on those guys because they would they would put up a, a very strong 10 yard split, right. very good explosion drill. So even though they didn't have that great 40, they weren't slow on a football field. And he found a way to pull those numbers out from inside that data. And use it as, as a stronger evaluation tool for an individual position. NFL teams have guys that are like that. Guys who dig really deep into the numbers and find those things that stand out. Uh, because, again, you're not just looking at these numbers. You're looking at tape, too. You're also looking at production metrics. A lot of that stuff goes into it. But even just within the athletic testing, there's more data that we can find. There's more information that we can find. Um, and there's NFL GMs that have found some neat ways to do that. It's coming. Oh, you you just cut out. The, you cut out at the end. There, <laughs> I was just saying. There's NFL, NFL teams have figured out how to do this stuff. Got they've, they've got ways to do this. Now, I do have a a, uh, a comment coming from my guy John DeMarchi. John DeMarchi, you're on fire. Don't you stop, boy. Don't you stop. Listen, uh, he says Don Grimato, respect. Beyond that, does the RAS extend to other sports? Hint, hint. The Sabers, because the Sabers have been some trash, and I'm not a Sabers <laughs> guy, but those fans are. Um, and they want to know, can you help <laughs> on the hockey side? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been asked about that specifically for basketball and for hockey before about whether or not it translates. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't have the data for it. Um, one of the things that makes Raz as, as useful as it is the amount of volume that I've been able to collect. Raz right now has about 21,000 players. Um, at one point, I had like 25. I, I purged some that didn't really have enough testing to be valid. But right. um, it's got about 21,000 players in it. Um, that's going to be tough to do for a sport like basketball because there's a lot fewer prospects for basketball than there is for football. Um, I'm not sure how that looks for hockey, and I'm not sure how those metrics transit or even how they're gathered. Um, but the calculation itself, if I had the data, I would throw the data right at it. And I'm, I'm all about throwing numbers and stuff. I like your numbers. You're a numbers guy. You're the yeah. map bomb. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got I got I got You know what? I got to bring the super chat up. Um Ombre Lobb says, yo, explain why Tyler Shelvin is the best defensive tackle to pick. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll, I'll go with just, just with your premise. So Shelvin didn't test all that well, but if you're looking for a nose tackle, he tested just fine. You don't really have to worry about the testing if you're looking for a guy who's going to be that, that interior run defender who can act as an anchor to your defensive line. If that's the guy you see on tape, the guy that you need for your football team, that's the perfect pick is, is a guy that can anchor your line. Um, Snacks Harrison was a horrible athlete as far as tests were considered. And he was fantastic on a football field because right. he was an anchor. He was just a beast in the middle. Yeah, he's not going to chase your quarterback down ever. Um, and he's not going to fly through that, that deep or offensive line and, and split those defenders every time. But he's going to command two guys, and he's going to make them work for every damn play. 
Um, and that's the kind of guy that you're looking at for those type of guys. If you're looking for a nose tackle, you're really only looking for, is he big? Because you got to be big to be a nose tackle. Right. Um, how good is his broad jump? I mentioned that before about how broad jump is, is tends to be a big deal for, for guys that are bursting off the line. If you're a huge dude with a, even a good broad jump, not a great, just a good broad jump, but you're gigantic, that's a huge deal because that's a lot of weight to be pushing forward, man. That's a lot of weight to get moving quickly. Um, and then the 10 yard split, you know, uh, if his 10 yard split is good. Bench is, I, bench is usually high for nose tackles because they're just yeah, big boys. Boys. Um, But I don't know that it matters as much because I, I think they just do that to pad the numbers. <laughs> so let's, let's jump into uh, the 2019 draft then. All right. So first pick, Ed Oliver. He scored very high. And right now, most fans are, are, are waiting for um, two things, for him to jump off the screen and really make a difference this year, but also to play in his proper position. A lot of times, the Bills had him playing right over the center. That's not where he excels the most, but he scored quite well. So does he need to stay in his three-tech position for us to receive the dividends of his high score on the Raz? Yeah, you're talking about a guy who... He's under 300 pounds. He's in that little bit of a tweener position where he's not not quite that big defensive tackle, but not quite small enough to be an end. Uh, he ran a 4.73, which is almost the best 40-yard dash for a defensive tackle that I have in my database. Which again, 20,000 players. Um, you know, it's it's he's really fast, really explosive. Like half of his half of his tests were 99th percentile. He had a 99th percentile vert broad 40-yard dash, 10-yard uh, split and shuttle and just shy of that for his cone. So six out of six out of 10 metrics, he was 99th percentile pretty much, you know, that's, that's ridiculous that, that that's, he has that kind of athletic talent, but that's, that's why he was drafted so often. There's, there's so much potential to, to get that athleticism on a football field. Um, you got to put it together. And one of the concerns about Ed Oliver was the, that he was a little bit raw, that he needed a lot of development to really be able to, to make use of that. Um, I think that's what you're seeing right now is just trying to feel that out and trying to, to use that athleticism. Um, not every defensive tackle is going to be Aaron Donald and walk on the field and just rep shop every play. Right. Um, some guys just need a little bit of help. Um, they they got to have at least somebody else there. Getting a nose tackle is huge for an interior pass rusher because it, it helps free up um, the not just the, the amount of uh, defenders that they're or blockers that they're going to face, but the amount of space that they're going to have to work with. You get a good enough nose tackle in there that can eat a lot of space. You're going to get into that that uh, uh, the Williams the Williams brothers that we had from the Vikings some years back. Yeah, really brothers. Um, but you remember those guys? We had Pat yep. Williams, who mm -hmm. was I always joke because he was listed. At, I think I think it was like 317 pounds or something. His, ent his entire career, but he played at like 340, 350, and they just kept listing him at 317. They're like, maybe we list him that he'll feel better about it. Um, <laughs> But if you get a guy like that, that really frees up your other interior rusher and it allows you to do a For lot sure. more with him. And I think that might be what Ed Oliver's missing a little bit because he's got a guy behind him that can take care of business. You know, he's he's got a guy that that's behind him in that that front seven who's doing a lot of good work. Um, I just think he needs somebody else up front to help eat up a little bit of space to really get him in his element and let him really start to to blow up and use that athleticism. So um, let's move on to Cody Ford. Yeah, Ford didn't test all that well, and when when he came out, he actually test. I actually have him in the database as a guard. I'm not sure has he, has he has he been playing just tackle for you guys right now. He, so here's the thing: he started off at right tackle, then they moved him to right guard, and now they're trying to make him a left guard. So okay. it's it's all over the place. We don't know. Guard guard's a better spot for him anyway. Um, okay, he, he has really good arm length for a guard. Um, he has decent arm length for a tackle. He's 34 inch arms. So he's, he's, he hit those benchmarks, but athletic testing wise, he didn't do all that well. Um, his agility drills were his poorest drills. And those, as I mentioned before, the shuttle is one of the most important drills for an offensive lineman. And his shuttle was very poor. His cone was even worse. Um, but he's a big dude. He's, he's got a lot of mass on him and he's got a lot of length. You put him on the inside and you get him moving around a little bit, I think you can find a lot more success. But I'm glad that they're moving him inside the guard. I think that's a better spot for him anyway. Okay. Um, from a testing standpoint, um, that lack of agility can hurt him if you're asking him to do those type of things. Um, if a team's asking him to get on the move a whole lot and, and try to try to pull in those short areas, you're going to have some problems with a guy that doesn't have that type of skill set. 
Um, it could just be a technique thing. It could just be that he needs to get his technique a little bit better. Um, but his other tests were perfectly fine for an offensive lineman. He had really good uh, explosion drills, good 40-yard dash. You know, his speed was perfectly fine. And, again, he's huge. Uh, part of what hurt him from a RAS standpoint was those, those bad agilities, and he had a bad bench, which, as I mentioned before, long arms, bad bench. Right. Um, so it, it hurt his score a little bit more than I think it really should have just because, I mean, I, I count it and I acknowledge that that's not a perfect – it's never going to be perfect. Um, but I think that's what really hurt his score was just that he's got long arms and he chose to do the bench press and he did about what you'd expect a guy with long arms to do. Um, I remember him being pretty good on the football field and I always thought that he would do a lot better at guard. So I'm, I'm hopeful that they keep him there and I'm hopeful that he uses those talents to just blow guys off. He's got a mean demeanor for it does. He's, he's really, he really likes to hit people and put people on the ground, uh, which is another one of those things that you can't really measure. But if you've got that, and at least baseline athleticism, and then they tell you to go beat up on people, you should do all right. You know what? You and I both, we we both share the same sense of it. I mean, I, I'm a frustrated Bills fan um, and, and that, to a fault because I might be judging him too soon. And it's and it's not on it's not his fault. They've moved him from right tackle all the way to the left guard. So he's never had a home. So I'm hoping from what you just said, it really translates. Um, and with some training and some coaching, he fixes that. I mean, maybe gets a little lighter somewhat so he can fix that agility. Maybe he becomes a left guard that we need him to be. We also just drafted Forrest Lamp. And that in itself will be competition. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out um, in the offseason. Um, here's an interesting one for you. Dawson Knox scored really well for a tight end, but the production has not been there for us um, just yet. So Dawson Knox... I'm sure there's a lot of guys that have scored high like him. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? So I like Knox, and his production wasn't there in college either. I mean, pr production was always something that was lacking. A lot of that had to do with how the offense was based in college and the types of targets that he had to compete with um, on the same football field. He wasn't he wasn't top dog there or second dog there. You know, he had he had a lot of guys that that are, are very good players taking targets away. Um, but Knox is a very high upside guy. And if you're drafting a tight end, especially you want those elite athletes, you know, it's, it's one thing to say you want to get the better athletes at every position It generally correlates well for every position, right? When we're talking about tight end. Um, you gotta have an elite athlete. Um, I, I think I mentioned it a couple of days ago that there's, there's only one tight end in the last 20 years who's had a 750 yard receiving season or better who scored below five for Raz, which was Jordan Reed, who just retired. Um, and Jordan Reed was hurt at the time right. that he tested and through most of his career. But at the time he tested, he was hurt. And that's part of why he didn't test as well, because he was testing while hurt. Every other tight end that's become a number one receiving threat has been at least above average as an athlete. Then you start looking at the great tight ends, the guys that have the really good production, your thousand yard guys. All of them are elite tier athletes. Kelsey's an elite athlete. Kittle's right. an elite athlete. Gronkowski, Jimmy Graham, all those guys were top-tier athletes. If you're going to bank on, on athleticism at any position, tight end is, is the best one to do it at. And I think that's what the Bills were going for with Knox. Um, the analytics, obviously, has become a Very little bit bigger here in, in Buffalo the last couple of years. And if you're going to play the numbers, that's that's what you're doing. You're playing the numbers. And it isn't a matter of whether every, hit's gonna, every, every pick's going to hit. Um, and even if they have a higher chance to because of things like athletic testing, but it's always right to play the best numbers, to play the best odds. And I think that's what the bills were going for with Knox was just playing the best numbers that they could to, at a position that they needed to upgrade. So interesting because a lot of folks right now are, are feeling like guys give Knox a chance. He's too athletic for us to just give up on him. Um, it's just a matter of concentration. Cause I mean, he's dropping balls here and there like easy ones, but he'll catch the tough ones. So we're in a, we're in a position where we're like, we need you to step up because we've got such a dynamic offense. You are a big part of it, but he just hasn't panned out. So with that, should we wait on him? Is that one of those things where patience he'll get it together? And that's generally true of the tight end position anyway. Tight end position is one of those ones where it usually doesn't come together in year one and oftentimes doesn't come together in year two. Mm. You're usually looking in that third year and you're waiting for that guy to really blow up. You know, it's it, it happens with most tight ends. Most tight ends, it does, and Jimmy Graham didn't blow up in his first year. He was a, a 
that wasn't a, wasn't as early of a pick. Right. Um, Rob Gronkowski was one of the very few that really started to pick up his rookie year because most guys don't. Um, Kelsey didn't, Kittle didn't. All these guys they didn't pick up until year two, year three, and then they blow up. Um, tight end is just one of those positions. There's a lot of things to learn. You, know, you got to learn the, the wide receiver position and an offensive line position at the same time. You got to understand blocking assignments. You got to understand routes. You've got to understand how to pick up guys, how to block and release. There's so many individual pieces to a tight end's job. It makes it for a very difficult transition from college to the pros. Um, but you always want to look at patients with tight ends unless they just are terrible. I mean, you, you can't let a bad player out there. But I don't think I've ever got that impression from Knox. I, I don't think I've ever looked at him and been like, yeah, he's garbage. Get rid of him. Okay, you know, good. It's, it's a guy that you, you have. There's, there's talent there. There's enough there to develop. And you just got to give him the time and the opportunity. You're 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 giving me hope because there's sometimes, man, I am like, fam, Dawson Knox, would you get your act together? But and a lot of people keep telling me, just chill, have some patience. But there goes a time where you're like, how much time you got to give a guy, right? And Terrain Edmonds is a name that comes up because a lot of folks are saying, Man, he's only 22. Give him time. Some folks are like, I don't have the time. Like, enough of that. Like, he needs to produce right now. So there there comes a and that's why we are fans. Because we don't know anything. <laughs> we say a whole bunch of stuff. The GMs are the ones that are part of that. So uh, yep. that in itself is a tough one. Um, I'm looking at um, the last draft class. And um, AJ Epinesa, Zach Moss. An interesting one is Gabriel Davis. Right? Are those three picks right there. Contributors all last year. What are your thoughts on those guys? Yeah, AJ Epinesa was one of my favorite guys last year. And the Bills didn't draft any elite athletes in the 2020 draft class. Their highest highest scoring guy for Raz was Isaiah Hodgins, who was a 7.52, uh, 7.56 rather. Everybody else was below that. And four of them were below average. They were below five. Um, but again, it's one of those things where you got to look a little bit deeper. Uh, the first article that I wrote for Pro Football Network, the article that I think that helped, get, helped me get hired at Pro Football Network, was about AJ Epinesa. I, I wrote about how people ex people had this 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 uh, takeaway from his combine, like he had this terrible combine. Oh, he didn't test all that well, and da da da. And it's like if you watch him on tape, what did you expect him to test? Because he's not fast on tape. That's mm -hmm. not how he wins. He doesn't win because he's fast and quick. He wins because he has incredible length that he knows how to use well, and really good size that he knows how to use well. He's a huge defensive end. Big boy. Uh, 6'5", six, six, 275, that's a big defensive end. Um, I actually built a, an entirely separate position group out for defensive linemen over, I think it was 270 and under 310 to try to, to illustrate better the type of player that Epinesa is, because he's not alone. Uh, Zadarius Smith played for the Packers, did a great job. Zadarius Smith is the exact same type of player. Big guy, doesn't win on the outside on the edge. He's not a quick bender on the edge type guy, but he can use his length really well and he can overpower guys on, on the inside. That's the type of player that A.J. Epinesa is, and it really made him underrated. It helped him drop to the Bills where they picked him. Um, very good player, just needs to develop a little bit, just like every every rookie needs to develop as they as they get more playing time. Um, but he's a guy that they they needed to look past the numbers, and the Bills were smart enough to do that, to look past the numbers. Um, Zach Moss, along with Devin Singletary, the, the Bills don't have a super athletic backfield when it comes to their running backs. Um, but they drafted guys that broke a lot of tackles. Devin Singletary was very dynamic with the ball in his hand, and Zach Moss was really good at breaking tackles and overpowering guys. Um, they complement each other really well. I think this is another instance of the Bills just kind of playing with uh, valuation of the players that they're picking up and the value that they put behind the guys they're putting on the field. Um, they wanted to build a specific type of backfield, and that's what they were looking for, is guys that complement each other. Um, and I think they did a really good job of, of doing that. They, they got a couple guys on the field that, that you know, by themselves, not going to be 1,000-yard rushers, not going to go out there and just blow everybody away every play. But you need to get yardage, and you've got running backs that can get it in different ways. And they built their offense – through those types of players and those guys fit right into those roles. So even though they didn't test well, you're not drafting them. Not, not every draft pick is going to be a superstar. I and mean, that's just any team. Not every draft pick is going to be an instant pro bowl or a superstar sensation. Right. Um, some guys are just out there to do a job. Um, and there's a lot of terms that get used as a derogatory for that. But I mean, if you're playing in the NFL for 10 years and you're a jobber that whole time, 
more power to you. That's a fantastic career, man. Hundred <laughs> percent. Every time. Um, one of my favorite guys to look back on is, is Donald Driver, played for the the Packers. That's right. Today. Right. One of the most one of the most underrated careers in the NFL. Put up thousand yard seasons like every year, forever. He's got a had a ridiculous statistical career, but he did it all as a number two receiver for pretty much the entire time, because he was so good at playing that role and building himself up in that role. Totally respectable to be that type of player. And I think the Bills are trying to find some of those guys. Um, the Bills weren't building up from a dynasty. They were building up from being a bad team for a lot of years. Yes. And bad teams got to get good players. They don't got to get a million great players because you keep shooting for those guys, you're going to miss a lot. Sometimes you just, you just got to pick guys that you know are going to hit for what you need them to do. Um, and I think that that's a lot of what they did with a guy like Moss. Hundred um, percent, Gabriel. And, and before you get to Gabriel Davis, I wanted to ch- touch on John John Lamarchi. Uh, so his personal point of view, he says Bills lack elite speed on the offense and defense, which is why I hope JOK or Oway fall to the D. Etienne or Rondell Moore uh, slide on the offense. Does Math Bomb think we have a need for speed both sides of the ball? So I'm a little bit biased because my team is just. So slow. Uh, I, I follow the Detroit Lions, and they built the slowest roster in the NFL. Um, so I, I'm I'm all big on speed. The Lions are overcorrecting, which I love. Everybody they picked up has been like super fast. Um, and then they signed Corn Elder, which is like the opposite of fast. But aside from that, everybody's been been burners. So I, I love overcorrecting if your team has a deficiency of speed. I, I don't think the Bills have that much of a deficiency on speed. Um, to the point where it's it's like the biggest problem that the Bills right. have. Um, building an, an identity on offense and on defense is really tough, and it's one of those underrated things where – sometimes it's overrated, but it's one of those underrated things where if you don't have it, you really need to get it. Uh, I think Josh Allen is, has done great things for the Bills for building that identity on offense, for, for being able to say this is who we are as a team. I'm not sure we really have that yet on defense. So if, if that's what they decide that they want to do is going for speed and trying to get so much faster than everybody else on defense, um, that's, that's a respectable way to go. Um, I, I don't know that that's what the Bills have been trying to do on defense. I think they've been doing the same thing that the Lions were doing, that the Packers have been doing, the Dolphins have been doing um, with different levels of success. Lions kind of at the bottom and then everybody else somewhere – varying degrees of well above that um, right. <laughs> but the bills have, have, have had a similar approach with a lot of the types of players that they're looking for and speed isn't the priority at every position um but they're they've got enough speed i mean you like you mentioned Ed, we keep talking about edmonds edmonds has wheels man the guy can move he can move um, sideline so, yeah. <laughs> side so if you've got that type of guy and, and you're building that type of interior to your defense um, where you've got your, 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 uh, the middle of your defense where it has a lot of speed, then you don't necessarily need as much speed up front. Um, you can kind of make up for it just by having rangy linebackers. The Bucks did that a little bit. Their Super Bowl team did that. Um, so there's, there's different ways to build a team. Um, I don't think it's wrong to go after fast players ever. Um, I'm, I'm all about building fast teams. Um, on, on offense, the Chiefs built that, blue, built that blueprint of getting super fast at pretty much every position. And a lot of teams have tried to copy that. Um, that w- Whenever you have that happen, teams try to counter it on defense. So They, they, they uh, absolutely do, for sure. Yeah. Um, Gabe Davis, and, and I want to jump on Gabe Davis, then I'm going to play you a clip, um, and I'm going to ask you to defend um, yourself from this clip. So uh, we'll jump into Gabe Davis, and I'll play the clip for you. So Gabe Davis came in uh, – solid for us uh we didn't anticipate that he was gonna have the year he had i think he had like almost like eight touchdowns something something pretty crazy um and i think just shy of 500 yards so he really stepped in so we got rid of john brown john brown was released we brought in manuel sanders but i still anticipate a a a relatively solid year um again from gabe davis so how did he test and what did you think of his performance this year he tested all right um gabe davis came out Crap, I just hit the wrong button. Uh, he came out with a 6.88 out of 10, which is okay. fine. That's not a great That's not a great score. It's not a bad yeah. score. Um, but he got that score based on uh, good, great size, good explosiveness, good speed, and then really bad agility. Drift. So it's one of those things where he, was, he had his score dr- drug down almost exclusively by one area of testing. Um, 
Taller receivers don't necessarily test well for agility drills very often. They tend to win by being more explosive. This goes back to that typing stuff that we talked about earlier. You know, different types of players win right. in different types of ways. Um, I didn't watch enough of Davis to see if if that was how he was winning on the football field. But I would guess, just based on on what I know from from past, is that most likely he's not your quick, small, speedy guy. He's he wins because he's able to burst off the line, beat press fairly well, um, and use his size to box guys out. You know, you don't have to be an elite tester if that's how you win. Devontae Adams is a very similar type of player. He doesn't win because he's you know some ridiculous, stupid athlete. He wins because he's smart and he uses the traits that he does have better than the guys that he's facing. That is that, and here, here, and here's the thing: we have Gabriel Davis, and we we double we double dip that receiver because we grabbed Gabriel Davis, and then we grabbed Isaiah Hodgins, and Hodgins was coming on um, in in training camp until he got hurt. Based on, I mean, he scored at seven point five. You said so higher than Gabe Davis. So can we see something coming from Isaiah Hodgins this year? If he gets the opportunity, I, absolutely. It's another guy that he's a, he's a big body guy. Um, he didn't run the best 40 yard dash. I, I mentioned before that typing thing with safeties. It's similar with, with wide receivers where if you have a guy that doesn't run the best 40, but he's pretty explosive and he's got some size to him. You know, that's, that's really helpful. Um, Hodgins probably would have had an, a, an elite score above eight. He had a terrible, he decided to do the bench press. Wide receivers never bench. He decided True. to bench and did awful. So um, he only put up nine reps on the bench. That's terrible. I, I asked um, him about that actually. I had a chance to yeah. talk to him, and I was like, "Dude, bench press. What? What? What the deal? What's going on?" He says, "Yo, let's 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 try not to talk about that." I was like, hey. <laughs> "I wonder if he just felt pressured. Like there were other guys doing it. He felt like he should do it too. Maybe, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Most wide receivers they just skip. They just skip the bench entirely. Um, they don't even bother testing it. Um, but he he tested fine." For a bigger guy, he tested really well, and and the, what really hurt him was that awful bench, and then he didn't run the best forty. Forty, that's um, right. But from an athletic standpoint, bigger guys you want to be explosive in general, and he's got that. That's one of the traits that he met, he, he measured well at. Uh, I'm I'm so interested now. So uh, let me play this clip for you, sir, and uh, I I really want your thoughts on it, and then uh, and then we'll come right back, and you can defend it. All right, one second. At what point do we stop being like, oh, he's athletic. Oh, he has he has a lot of good skills. He can run very fast and just take a, and just take a player. Caring about that? Yeah, like what what is it about that? Why why can't the tape just be the tape? The tape, right? Because I see people, and I'm I'm gonna call out I'm gonna call out our Buffalo Fanatics uh, group chat. I see people looking at the Raz score and like salivating, right? And they're like, oh, look at this Raz score, and it's like, yeah, but like. Why, right? Like, why? Why are we like dumbing it down and, and doing math equations to figure out if a guy is good or not? Why can't we just look at the tape and see? Been on that. That's my guy, Casey. Love my guy, Casey. Uh, he's outspoken. And there are a lot of people that feel the same way, though. Why are we going and doing all this math? Just look at the tape. The tape tells you everything. And I think a lot of people don't realize yes, the tape is great. Take the tape. Take my evaluations as well and merge them. But a lot of people think it's the RAS score because a lot of people put a lot of faith in the RAS score. Now, I don't want to hate on my guy Casey. Casey, I still love I got love for you, but it had to be played. So oh, yeah. what are your thoughts on people that think that way? Yeah, and it's it's not uncommon um, to, you know, you always have the guys that my one of my favorite, my one of my favorite buzzwords to get is, is tape don't lie, which is absolute horse crap. Tape lies all the time. <laughs> all the time. Talk on uh, it. Because and, and and again, it's not it's not down to him. But tape lies all the time. The the Lions took T's Tabor in the second round, and he was freaking terrible. I knew he was terrible, and I watched his tape. Oh, I love you had, I know why I did. You had people. You had people watching him. Pro football. Pro football focus had him as, as one of their top players. They loved that guy on tape, and he was garbage. He finished his NFL career with the Lions with zero pass deflections. Oh, not not interceptions. Pass deflections. He never touched a football. And that's obscene to think of that kind of thing. And he's not alone. Trent, Trent Richardson was one of the most well thought of running back prospects at his time. He went th you know, third overall. He was one of the ridiculously well thought of prospects. And he busted so hard. And people, af after the fact, they were like, oh, yeah, we always knew, always knew he was going to bust, which is absolute crap. No, you didn't. Everybody thought he was going to be good. And they were wrong. It right. happens. Tape lies. Um, 
but numbers lie too. You know, guys, guys test well and then just don't do well. If a guy tests really well and you haven't watched him, um, that's a perfectly valid reason to be like, oh God, did you see how this guy tested? Now I got to go watch his tape. That's, that's perfectly valid. Just right. as valid as having a guy who tests poorly and be like, I don't know, man. Maybe we need to go back and look at him a little bit. Because guys who test well get more opportunities in the NFL. They're drafted higher in the yep. NFL. They do better in the NFL in part because of those other two things. They get drafted higher and they get better opportunities. So it's important. You can't just ignore it. But that also means you can't ignore the tape. You know, there's there's guys who test poorly that look really good on tape. And you're like, what am, what am I missing? And it might just be one of those things I mentioned before, Orlando Brown and his length, Anquan Bolden and his, his strength on the football field. Sometimes they just win in a way that isn't tested. Or they were just hurt. That happens too. Darius Leonard tested poorly. He pulled his hamstring while he was running his 40-yard dash and then tried to rush back to test at his pro day. Some guys just get hurt. That happens. They do. Um, but it's, it's again, it's all part of the picture. You need to take it all in. But those those guys that say they that say you just got to go back to the tape. By all means, go back to the tape. But generally, the tape tells you the exact same story as how they test. Well, and, and that's usually how it, how it goes. I will say this: I do have a segment that a, I call it "Say It with Your Chest," and I think I should have made you just jump in there and say what you <laughs> The tape is a lie. You know I mean? The tape is a lie. I don't believe everything you see on tape. And I've never actually heard someone say the tape is a lie because most people say the eye in the lies. sky doesn't lie, right? You always hear that. Yeah. What you see doesn't lie to you. But Mass Bomb is like, nah, fam. No, 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 no. It does lie to you. So All the time. Right. <laughs> and and sometimes numbers lie as well, right? You look at statistics. Oh, yeah. And like, yeah absolutely. Guy just, he's amazing. And then you look and you're like, man, he ain't, he ain't shit. We had uh, – there was a pass um, rush. But that you were – uh, <laughs> There was a pass rusher back, I think, in, in like 2012. Back when Ziggy Yonsa came out that draft. And I forget which which pass rusher it was, but he had a ridiculous amount of, of, of sacks. It was all in the SEC. Everybody was like, oh, God, he's, he should go in the first round and da 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 And then I went and watched him, and I, I timed it. And in, in like a four-game span, the average time it took from the ball to be snapped for him to get a sack on the place he got a sack was like seven seconds. And I was like, how did he get double-digit sacks? Like who has that kind of luck? But it's, it's, it's it just goes to show, man. There's there's always more context to stuff. And and going back to tape, you know, sometimes guys just play against bad competition, and you don't want to just you don't want to have that be your only thing. But sometimes that's the case. Sometimes they just play against worse players, and they look better because they're against uh, better players. For sure, uh, it's context. There, there was a there was a center came out of the University of Ohio some years ago. He had 28 pancake blocks as a senior coming out. Um, he ended up going undrafted, which he absolutely should have. Um, but you watch him on tape, and it's it's just he sluggish as all hell, could barely move. But when he did get his hands on somebody, you know, he he put him in the dirt. He straight right. up tackled people sometimes. He had quite a few penalties in there as well. But it's another one of those things where anything can lie to you if you ignore all the other context around you. If, 100%. If you, just, if you just take one stat, it's probably lying to you. It's, that's just the way that it is. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by, listen, we were only supposed to do 20 to 25 minutes, but dude, you are on fire and I got to keep it rolling. Fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm, let's, let's keep it rolling. You are joined by myself, Rico, and my guy, Math Bomb, aka Kent. Is it Kent Lee Platty? Am I, I want to say it properly. Yep. Yep. I, I, I added the middle name so that people would pronounce my last name right. Um, <laughs> and what ended up happening was people who were pronouncing my last name right started mispronouncing it. And I don't know how that happened. It it is what it is. Totally it's backward. Is it platy or plat? It's plat. Yep. The E is, the e is pronounced. Yep. Excellent. So um we are we are joining. We're talking everything evaluations, the bills. Now I want you to put your bills hat. Now, before you do put your bills hat, uh, my guy Dave Money Tilt says, you know what? He said, and I believe he's agreeing with you. So you got to use both in conjunction. The more ammo you have at, the, at your disposal to make an educated guess, excuse me, uh, make an educated decision where the outcome is not guaranteed, you use what you have. Yep, absolutely. I, Tools for your toolbox. Box. You can't say it any any different than that. That's, that's great. Now, we are going to touch on the lines because I really do want to know about your lines. But put your Bills GM hat on, please, sir. The Bills are picking at 30. Um, I don't know how much you know about the pieces we have on the def on the offense or defense or on the team altogether, I can help you out with that. Uh, Josh Allen is legit. 
We don't need a quarterback. Our running backs are Zach Moss and Devin Singletary. Our GM spoke today, and he doesn't feel like there's any need to really go out and get a running back. You may agree or disagree. Um, you said that you earlier you spoke on them. You said they're pretty decent. Um, so we may not need to do anything there. The receiving core is pretty decent. Stefan Diggs. Um, we've got um, Gabe Davis. We just brought on Emmanuel Sanders. We've got Cole Beasley. We've got some aging guys on the squad, but nonetheless, not bad. Isaiah Hodgins is coming on. Isaiah McKenzie. Tight end. Dawson Knox. You say, give us time. He'll get there. The O-line. Daryl Williams. I mean, I can go on. Is there anything that you see on this defense or on the offense where you feel at the 30th pick, the Bills should pick this player? Not a specific player, but a specific position. I think the, All Bills, right, talk to me. the Bills really got to hit up that defense, specifically their pass rush. Their pass rush was not good. Okay. Um, and, and you got to fix that, right? That's that's one of the more important parts of your defense is getting a pass rush. Um, where the Bills are picking and the way that the talent in this class lines up is a really it, it really meshes well because there's a lot of edge defenders that are good in this class. Um, but I, I the, the way that I talked about it before was that it's it's like a, a used car salesman. You always got to ask yourself, okay, but what's the catch, right? Okay. Because you got a guy like Jason Oa who has that ridiculous, insane athleticism, but no stats to speak of, no right. sacks at all. Alarming. That's alarming. That's a big deal. Um, Aziz Ojolari, great explosiveness. Is his agility quite there? It's it's okay. It's not great. Um, is he big enough to play in a lot of schemes? Maybe, maybe not. Some schemes have a little bit different different look at that. Um, Gregory Rousseau. Rousseau is a huge dude. He came in heavy and, and didn't test out quite as well as some people were expecting him to. He could fall all the way to 30, similar to A.J. Epinesa for the exact same reason. He didn't test quite as well right. as people expected him to. Um, but if you're looking to improve your pass rush, the Bills are in a really good spot to do so. There's a lot of good talent in this class. Uh, Quiddy Pay is not going to fall that far. That, that's a pipe dream, I think. Um, you think Aziz, so? I, I don't think Pay's going to fall that far. People are going to look back at, at, at Pay's athleticism, the amount of agility that he has at that size, and just they just want that on, his, on their team. I don't think Pay falls that far. Um, Ojolari might. I have a feeling he's going to go a little bit higher just because there's a, there's enough edge needy teams that could, but he could fall. Um, Oa probably doesn't go in the first round for me. He kind of falls into that day two where you have a developmental guy. Um, but I'm sure that the Bills could use a player like that. They've got a coaching staff in place that I think could develop a player like Oa if given enough time. Um, so there's there's quite a few guys to pay attention to, and I think edge is the most important position for the Bills to look into. Now, if they don't, corner is a pretty close second for me. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of there's there's decent enough tools for the for the Bills secondary. But this is a good cornerback class, man. This you, you got you got J.C. Horn, Patrick Sertan, uh, Caleb Farley, um, kid from Northwestern whose name I'm blanking on. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good talent in the cornerback class this year, and right. the Bills have pretty much pick of the litter outside of Sertan and Horn, who are probably going to go way higher. Farley's got a back injury. He's he's probably the best corner in this class, but he's coming in with a, a significant, uh, not a significant back injury, several back surgeries recently, which mm -hmm. is significant, significant medical history. Right. Um, but he's a good enough player. Maybe they take that additional risk if he falls to him, taking advantage of the fact that he's fallen and hoping that the medicals check out. Right. Um, so it's a strong class for the needs that the Bills have on defense. Um, I still think they could use another interior rusher. Um, you mentioned nose tackle as one, but that's not a really high value position that the Bills are looking for. I do think they're looking for a nose, um, and you can get a nose day three and get a guy like Tyler Sheldon or um, what was the other guy? I'm totally blanking. Sorry, having a couple of them. Aleem McNeil, yeah. I love him. I love Aleem McNeil. He's one of my dudes. Right, sorry. Yeah. I have a feeling he goes day two. Um, doesn't have the length, but he's got he's just a great athlete. Oh, me, I love him, man. Um, Davion Nixon could go day two, got elite athletic traits, one of the better defensive tackles in this class, but it's a pretty weak defensive tackle class, even though I think the Bills have that need. Um, I think the fact that they need a nose is going to help them in terms of the value they're going to get out of that pick. Um, I wouldn't rule out a tight end on day two, even with Dawson Knox. A lot of teams are trying to this whole dual tight end thing they're trying yeah. to roll out. Um, I think that the Bills value it enough to go with that day two rather than day one. There's only really pits in the first round. Uh, Pat Fryermuth could fall to the second round. The Bills could be one of those teams that takes him the first. I don't think they do, 
But I, I think if they if that's what they want to build their offense out from is the tight end position, Pat Fryermuth could be the guy. He could be the guy. All right. So putting on the spot with the 30th pick, the Buffalo Bills select. Oh man, that's a tough one. Um, Marty Perkins, hmm. Oklahoma. <laughs> I I wouldn't take Perkins if, if I had an opportunity to take Perkins. Perkins isn't my guy. Um, not that he's a bad player. I just wouldn't take him that high. Got it. Um, Joseph Osai from Texas is probably the guy I think that would both be there and be the best Osai. pick for them. Um, Osai's got a lot of really good athletic traits. He's a very explosive type of pass rusher. Um, not every pass rusher is going to be that quick outside guy, as I said before. I think Osai is the type of guy that kind of blends um, – what the Bills have been looking for on their defense with good analytics, taking a yeah. guy where the numbers match up. Um, I think Osai, Osai would be a guy that they take there. They might be the team that takes the risk on Jalen Phillips out of Miami. Jalen Phillips is one of the best pass rushers in this class, one of the best athletes ever at the, at the edge position, um, which is a tough group to break into. There's a lot of you, insane athletes at edge. You can see him um, falling to 30? I, I could see him falling much further than that. He has a wow. very – very significant medical history. Um, uh, I heard. He, I've heard and then read. Yeah, he was almost forced to retire due to concussions. So um, Phillips is fantastic, but the Bills could be that team, just like I mentioned with Farley, that weighs that risk and says that he's just too good of a player to to let slide past this point. The Bills could be the team that, that takes that kind of risk on a guy like Phillips. Um, another name to look out for is Carlos Basham, Boogie Basham out of Wake Forest. Boogie. Um, really good player, um, kind of a tweener, um, does a lot of really good things, but he's, he's one of my favorite players in the draft. Um, okay. I, I always kind of put him right in that, that beginning of the second round area. Um, and the, the bills are almost drafting in the beginning of the second round. They could be the one that takes him. <laughs> I, I, I'm listen, I'm loving this. Now I, I told you we're going to play a game called two words. Um, and we're going to change it a little bit we're, we're I'm going to name players, whether they're on the bills roster currently on the. Detroit Lions roster currently or draft prospects. Sir, are you ready to play the game? Let's do it. Here we go. Give me a second here. I got to prop my thing up. My thing just went. Here we go. I want you to give me the two words that come to your mind when I name this player. Are you ready? Let's go. Here we go. Tease Tabor. <laughs> <laughs> Slow and inexplosive. Uh, I mentioned before, never a big fan of Tease Tabor, even as a prospect. And right. Those were the two things that just crushed his career, man. Man, and, and it's crazy because I, I, when he was coming out, I was like, man, I like this guy named Tease Tabor, man. He's nice. He's great. Florida. Yeah. He re- oh, dude, no good. And my my man, Kevin, was like, terrible player. Don't even think about it. And you just proved it to me. Um, TJ Hawkinson. Um, powerful and goofy. He's kind of a goofy dude. Um, but he's, he's powerful both as a, as a blocker and as a receiver catching the ball. He's, he's got a lot of power behind him. Carry on Johnson. Uh, injuries and explosive. Carry on Johnson is one of the most explosive running backs I've ever seen up until COVID hit. I went to, to Lions camp every year for the last decade. Um, the most explosive interior runner, runner that I've ever seen in a Detroit Lions camp. Man, injuries just just cut him down. It's and it it's 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 unfortunate too, right? Um, because big boy, he's going to do big things, but those injuries get to you. Yeah, he's a great dude too, man. He's, he's a good guy to follow on Twitter. Quintez Cephas, uh, explosive but slow. Um, mm. he's, he's he's got some explosiveness to his game, but long speed he has not. Are are you are you one of the and I, I'm going to call you an evaluator. Are you one of the evaluators that uh, whenever a white receiver is being described, they usually say hard worker, quick but not fast, gym rat, you know, all the prototypical things they say about wide receivers. Are you one of them? Are you just like man? He's a good receiver, and that's that. That that stuff, man. It it always goes back to like the guys they compare him to. And it's just keeps shifting from one guy to the next. And like it blows, it blows my mind when they think some of these guys are bad, bad athletes. Like Julian Edelman is a crazy good athlete, and people are like, "Oh, he's a hard, hard worker and lunch pail guy." And it's like he was a great athlete. You can get there. 
He's a great athlete, always has been. That's why he was able to switch positions. You can get there. You don't have to compare him to Welker, man. Right. <laughs> but they do that crap every year, man. It's, it's like a, and they just love throwing those terms out that mean absolutely nothing. I, I think it's totally uh, hilarious. All right. Um, give me something on Joe Tyron. Joe Tryon. Tryon, excuse me. Um, I'm only going to – the two words are very and explosive. Those are the two words that I'm using for him. Very um, explosive. Okay. He's, he's, he's kind of a one-trick pony for me, but it's a good trick. Mm. Okay. Uh, give me something on DeAndre Swift. I like DeAndre Swift's game. Uh, quick and versatile. DeAndre Swift can be used as a runner, as a receiver. They use him all over the field in the offense. They like they like breaking him out so out wide as a receiver. Sometimes he can catch, he can run, um, and he's very quick, man. The guy's so good in short area. Love it on the field. Mitchell Trubisky. Yeah. Biscuit and garbage. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> biscuit and garbage. <laughs> Yo, please explain. <laughs> Biscuit's my nickname for him. I called him Biscuit since he was at North Carolina. Uh, he's just not a good quarterback, man. And we we, we called him uh, Mitchell Three Pixky, uh, Mitchell Two Pixky. We had that one too. I, I always just called him Biscuit, and I love that you guys grabbed him just because now he can be the Buffalo Biscuit. Um, <laughs> Yo, that's too funny. Biscuit and wings. <laughs> That'd, yeah, be, you know, that'd, that'd be something, I'll tell you. <laughs> he's he's a good reclamation project. He he didn't he wasn't absolute trash for the for the, the the Bears as much as we like to rag on him. Um and if you you'd think that I would have a higher opinion on him because he always made the Lions look terrible. But that was <laughs> that was a bigger statement on the Lions than it was Trubisky. Absolutely. Uh DK Metcalf got huge and monstrous. You know, as much people like to talk about his speed, which he's got, he's just huge. Um, I mentioned Anquan Bolden being able to out-muscle guys and beat guys in the air. Metcalf can do that. He's just also explosive and fast. So he's he's got that going for him. My guy Tilt Money says, uh, Trubisky was so overrated coming out one year starting. Yes, I am biased because I w- he went to NS- NCSU, but I don't think he's an upgrade at backup for QB. Oh, he says, oh, he doesn't. Or do you, are, do you think? I, I'm, I'm trying to think. I don't. I think he says he doesn't think he's an upgrade at the, at the backup. He feels that like we should have kept Matt Barkley. Matt Barkley, Barkley, or, Barkley ain't good either. <laughs> what do you I, think? We, if we have more time, I'll go into my whole backup quarterback spiel. Uh, backup quarterback is a completely different position from quarterback. Let's talk about it, man. Let's go. Um, I don't evaluate quarterbacks and backup quarterbacks equally. A lot of people think it's just different tiers of the same position. Um, I evaluate backup quarterback as if it's a completely different position. I don't even consider it the same position. And, and um, I must hold well, before you continue. I must preface. He says he does think that he's an upgrade. <laughs> he is. <laughs> he sure. is because Barkley ain't good. Got it. Um, but but whenever I look at a quarterback, I, I look at a quarterback, and there's there's only one question you should ever ask yourself: Do I think he can start in the NFL? If the answer is yes, without conditions, then he's a first round pick. That's that's all there is to it. If your answer is yes, and you don't say, well, he needs a little bit of seasoning, maybe in a couple of years. If, if you don't add any of that crap, he's a first-round pick. Um, if you add anything to it, if you have to say, well, he might need a couple of years of seasoning, he's got to put some time under his belt, he needs to develop more as a passer, his his pocket presence isn't as good, he needs to update his mechanics, but there's always a condition. Now you're talking about a developmental quarterback. That's that second, third tier of quarterback. But a backup quarterback, you're not looking at a guy who can play because most backup quarterbacks are absolute trash when they get on a football field. You're, you're looking at a guy who's smart who has played in multiple offenses in college, Right. who comes from a football family. Um, what was the other ones? I, I, I've, I've had this whole thing built out because it's, it's a whole different position. It because is. You're not, you're, not looking about, you're not looking at that guy like, is he going to get on a football field and play well? You're looking at is, is he going to be able to get on a football field and run the offense as designed without miscommunication, without breakdowns with his receivers, without, being able, without screwing up those line calls, that's what you're looking at out of your backup because a backup's going to go out on the field and probably suck. That's just the way it is. So when you're looking up a backup quarterback, you're looking at a guy who is, who is there to help your starter and evaluate the types of looks that the defense has given, get in his ear during, during plays and play from that sideline. That's a totally different position than actual quarterback. Mitchell Trubisky is not a backup. He's a developmental starting quarterback. He's a guy that could play if he cleans up like a million things in his game. Got it. So he's not there to help Josh Allen. He's there to go in if Josh Allen gets hurt, 
to Fact. hopefully develop and become a better player so that the Bills can either flip him for picks or if Josh Allen gets hurt because he's on the move, he gets hit a lot. Um, you know, we saw that with with uh, Big Ben in in, uh, in Pittsburgh. He's a big guy, but he liked to move around for quite a few years. He got hit a lot. Eventually, you start to wear down. So you get a guy like Trubisky who can kind of step in when he needs to. That's what the Bills are looking at for a guy like him. You just mentioned something uh, that I never it never really crossed my mind. You said that they could have picked up Mitchell Trubisky to flip him for pick. Um, so, and which brings me to two players, Mitchell Trubisky and Jake Fromm. So Jake Fromm, trash? Because a lot of yeah. people are not a fan of Jake Fromm. No, Fromm ain't good. He, he doesn't have a very good arm. He has no athleticism. Um, there aren't a lot of, of upside developmental traits to him. Um, he's not one of those guys that you look at and you're like, I think he can start in the NFL. Again, that's that, that main question you got to ask. Like, do I think he can start in the NFL? For me, that answer was no for okay. Fromm. Okay. Um, then you look at what he has as a backup traits. Fromm played for an offense that was really bad at Georgia that had a lot of problems with it. Um, you know, we, we would actually saw there was a big conversation on Twitter today about if you put anybody else into that Georgia offense, would they even be good? If you put Justin Fields into that offense, would he have done well? He would have done better than Fromm, but he probably wouldn't have played well. That offense just wasn't designed very well and didn't execute very well. Mm. So Fromm was put in a bad position um, in, in college, except for his first year. He's pretty good his first year. Um, and he was just put in a bad position, but he didn't have any traits to overcome the deficiencies that the offense was giving him with. Um, the answer to the why the hell did we draft from is I don't I don't know. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have drafted him. In the fifth round for crying out loud. Yeah, I wouldn't have drafted him. Golly. Well, listen, folks, um, we we are joined by uh Mr. Kent Lee Platty. Um, fantastic guest today. I could talk to you for a good another hour. I I kid you not. Uh it's fun and there's a lot of questions. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna let I'm gonna leave the last five minutes. Uh, for us to take questions from uh, the chat right now, uh, we've got one of uh, one of my guys, uh, Pierre, says. Uh, so Math Bomb is saying that Matt Barkley is the backup QB. Barkley was there to help JA and was able to go in and run the offense without much hiccups. I, I think that's exactly what Barkley was brought in to do. Barkley had a decent arm, not not a whole lot of athletes, kind of average around a lot of different areas. But I think his whole reason was because he came from that pro style offense and. Uh, there's a lot of calls that are very similar to the pros and how the offense he ran in college was. So there wasn't a lot of learning, uh, a bigger learning curve in terms of the stuff that they're going to throw at him. I think that's the type of backup that he was. Somebody just mentioned something really interesting. I know that uh, Alex Smith is retired, but like, do you bring a guy like Alex Smith to come in as a backup? Uh, obviously better than than Trubisky. Players who, who become coaches, you know, it's always just whether or not the player wants to become a coach and, and whether they that's something that they feel like they want to do. I think if, if Alex Smith wanted to do that, that'd be the perfect kind of guy to bring in because Alex Smith, people forget because of his injuries, but Alex Smith used to be a very mobile quarterback. He used to be very good on the run. He just didn't have that good of an arm. Um, but he's a very good type of player to put in there behind somebody like Allen to help help teach him to learn some of those things. I agree. That would that would actually be a pretty uh, pretty good pickup. Uh, my guy Kendall Mursky says uh, this is from Math Bomb says, "Have you thought about splitting the defensive tackle position into DTs and nose tackles to give more accurate RAS numbers for that position?" Yes, and nickels Great for question. nickels for corners, uh, slot for receivers, a bunch of different sub subtypes. I have a structure to do it in the code. I won't bore you with the details, but the the code exists. Uh, it. It's a it's a matter of data, and it just takes a long time to put that stuff together. And I don't have the time because of the draft. Got it, got it, got it. Well, listen, uh, I'm I'm just gonna take a couple more questions from from the chat, and uh, we'll let my my guy. Uh, Kent, uh, out of here. Kent, you have been fantastic. You were able to answer questions. I mean, I threw some players at you. Um, I even put you on the spot to become the Bills GM. Um, before we get out of here, I'm, I'll let the questions come in. But your Detroit Lions, are you confident? Are you pissed that it got rid? I mean, they just did a re and re. They just traded both quarterbacks. You you got you got rid of Stafford, which is some people might say is a top ten quarterback, and now you got Jared Goff. Yeah, Stafford, you know, it sucks to lose Stafford. Stafford was one of my favorite players in college back when he played at Georgia. So had, losing him after seeing him drafted and playing as well as he did for so long, that sucks, man. But we're also in a rebuild, and it's his fourth staff. I mean, I totally understand him wanting to move on. Um, getting Jared Goff, I think, was the harder part of that whole deal because Goff right. just ain't it. 
So I agree. That's the hard part. Is he's expensive and bad. So what do you? What do you? So are you guys? Are, how do you feel about your head coach? <laughs> right. I don't like, I don't <laughs> yeah. See that that whole thing. Like, if if you get a chance, you'd actually get a kick out because I know you like you like football talk. You get a chance right? to watch that whole interview. Campbell had a lot of great stuff he talked about. He, that did. Interview, he did. Interview and it was fantastic. But the moment he said that, you were like, "That's this whole interview now. It doesn't <laughs> even matter what else he could have said." He could have just explained to you step by step how they're going to win a Super Bowl this year, and it wouldn't have mattered because he said they're going to bite kneecaps off multiple times. Um, he's he's a weird guy, but their their entire staff is made up of former players right now. They were, Dan Campbell was a former player. Uh, Anthony yeah. Glenn, uh, Anthony Lynn, uh, Antoine Randall Ells on their staff now. They got a whole bunch of former players. Um, Mark Brunell is their quarterbacks coach, so they've got a whole oh, bunch yeah. of guys that are former players. Um, it's a different approach, and I'm totally for taking a different approach. Um, I mentioned some of the things I liked about uh, Brad Holmes before, and, and I, I'm hopeful that his stuff works out. But his track record at, at evaluating quarterbacks is bad. Mm. And now that that's where we're at, um, I'm worried about that part. But I have no concerns about how he's going to build a defense and how he's going to build some other aspects of the offense. Um, I'm, I'm not excited because we're in the middle of a rebuild and rebuilds suck. Um, so th this is a rebuild. You're, you're, uh, you, you've accepted it. Oh, yeah. It's a full-on rebuild. It's a full-on rebuild. <laughs> full-on um, round up. J-O-K. Jeremiah Osou. Osu uh, Koromoa. Koromoa, that's the one. Uh, does he fall? Can he fall to 30? Yes, he can. I think he might. Um, it's a little bit difficult with guys that don't have a position um, because NFL teams don't always know what to do with those guys. Mm. Um, you saw it with Isaiah Simmons last year when the Cardinals yep. tried to use him because – not every team is is strong enough to use a guy that can move around at multiple positions because it isn't, oh, he can play these two positions that we suck at. It's like, no, he's going to play one of those positions and some garbage guy is going to play the other one until you get a good player at both. Like, if you have a guy that can play linebacker and safety, you need a good safety and a good linebacker to right. complement him. You got you know, it. Because, because then you can do stuff with him. You can move him around because you've got somebody else to fall into his spot that he just vacated. Um, and that's going to be the issue with JOK. He's not as good of a prospect as Simmons was. He's not quite the athlete. Um, he's still a good player and a good prospect. Yeah. Um, I'm just a little worried with how teams are going to deploy him and how they're going to value that. I think Simmons struggling a little bit in his rookie season might have soured some teams to how that evaluation works because they're going to be like, well, we know we have to play him at one position, and I don't know that he's a safety. Some teams don't know that he's a linebacker. So um, it just depends on where they're going to deploy him. Last question for me, um, non-quarterback, who who are your who's the three best prospects coming out of this draft overall? Like those oh, are your easy. three best. Uh, Panay Suel is the best offensive tackle prospect in this class. Easy. Got it. Um, Rashawn Slater is probably fairly close behind him, but the thing to remember is that Rashawn Slater's best tape happened when he was 22 years old, right? Mm. Panay Suel put up the same level of tape when he was 17 years old at Oregon. That's a five-year difference in the same yeah. type of player. Um, they're only about a year apart in age now, but when you're, when you're talking about the level of talent that you're getting with Sewell, it's just so high. Awesome. Um, and he's huge. He's gigantic. So he's, he's just a really good player. Um, so Sewell's the easiest one. Kyle Pitts is one of the best tight end prospects we've had in some time. Um, you'll see me complain about it a little bit on, on Twitter if you're following me, just because Lions fans are going a little bit overboard with it. Um, because we've we've done this rebuild four times in the last 12 years, and each time they've taken a tight end in the first round, twice in the top 10, and it never works. And it's the 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 thing about Pitts isn't that he's a bad prospect, because he's not, he's a great prospect. Right. But all this stuff that they're saying about him, oh, he could be a wide receiver. He's so versatile. He's a, a matchup nightmare. You want to see some crap? Go look up, go search your favorite bad bus tight end in the words matchup nightmare. And you'll find hundreds of posts <laughs> about people talking about that. So it, for me, it's just a little fatigue with Pitts and, and with the Lions. I'm, I just can't see that in a rebuild. Can I tell you something? Yeah. If, if the Detroit Lions didn't pick, Eric Ebron, it would have been the Bills. And yeah. if, the, if the if your Detroit Lions didn't pick uh, Hawkinson, maybe it could have been the Bills. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. We were yeah. so close to picking both those guys. <laughs> um, so, Penny Sewell, uh, Kyle Pitts. Uh, you said Rashawn Slater. Do you have one, one more? Anybody on defense? Uh, 
not really. There isn't really a defensive guy that I think falls into that that realm of, yep. of like trend, trend, uh, a universal player that could play in any type of team. A lot of really good strengths on offense. Um, there's some good defensive players. That's nothing, nothing wrong with defensive guys, but not on that level. Um, I think if I had to name one, right, it, it would probably be Sertan, Patrick Sertan. Um, he's got the athleticism. He's got the length. He's got the size. He's got all the tools that you need to be a good cornerback process prospect. And he's a jerk. And that's just, you just want that if you're at a corner. Yeah. You gotta have that nastiness, man. Uh, my guy, Pierre Kimper says, yo, big fan of this guest. I was very skeptical, but you sold me, sir. Need to get this man on again. Big fan. Big <laughs> that's fan. why, that's why I grew the mustache. It just endears people immediately. Like you can't, you can't hate that. You just gotta be like, oh well, nice mustache. I like him. You, well, you listen. Yeah. Somebody said I gotta keep my mom away from me because that stash can kill. So <laughs> I might, have to, I might have to take it's that. It's dangerous. Absolutely. My wife don't even let me out of the house no more. <laughs> and she shouldn't. Ladies and gentlemen, my guy Kent Lee Platty has joined us. You've been fantastic. I'd love to have you on again. Uh, I think the energy was fantastic. And I'll tell you right now, after the draft, there's going to be some people that have questions for you. Um, obviously you want to, you, and I want, I really want to get into Detroit because, um, and we'll have, obviously we'll have some time to talk because we can talk about the draft and how your team did, but you are welcome anytime. Um, way more questions to be had, but we can do this on that, but we can't. Uh, so sir, uh, anything that, uh, you want to drop to, uh, the members where they can follow you, um, and, um, what you have coming down the pipeline. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at math bomb. I'm pretty easy to find. I got my little math bomb. That's got the hat and the mustache to match. Um, I, I talk about football all the time. I'm always posting my metrics and talking about that stuff. So you can always get me on Twitter. Um, you can go to my website. It's uh, relativeathleticscores.com or raz.football. Um, you can go there and look up any of these cards that we've been talking about, any of these players. You can go look up any player from 1987 all the way to 2021. Uh, it's, it's 35 years worth of data. So go nuts. You can switch positions right on the website. If you want to see what Panay Suel would look like as a wide receiver, go nuts. He ain't going to play it. But you at least know how well he tested there. Um, well, uh, and I, I'm so I'm so glad about it, man. So everybody, jump in there. I actually uh, went on went on and tried to mess around with the the RAS score and tried to put my my statistics in on what I used to. And halfway through, I was like, man, I'm giving up, man. I don't want to get a a point zero one score. I'm not. I, I'm, I'd, I'd be ready to knock on your door and fight you. So I, I didn't want to do. Yeah, that. there's there's a calculator on the site. So if you're curious what you would score, you can go out there. And and I always I always bring that up, man, because everybody thinks, God, I could have scored that well. Probably not. These guys that score bad, they're still the best athletes of their field, man. Absolutely. And I'll tell you this. Um, I I had a chance to talk to uh, Dimitri Felton. Yeah, and he didn't like his score, man. He, he, he DM'd me about that. He didn't like that. I brought it up. I was like, fam, you scored a 0.1. Yeah, he don't like that stuff. <laughs> oh, he didn't like that. We no. That interview is going to be dropping sometime soon, guys, but he was not too happy about mm -hmm. that. But uh, he kept it He kept it real. He kept the genius. He says, you know what? I, I just got to prove some people wrong. So, uh, folks, form. that's it for me. That's it for my guy, Kent. Kent, you were fantastic. Uh, please, we should have you again. If you're free, we'd love to do this again. Um, and uh, I bet you I might have some more guests to come and follow. So uh, you guys have yourself a fantastic night. It's the Rico Report. It was my guy, the math bomb himself. And uh, until next time, it's your boy. And I'm gone. Ladies and gentlemen, we are tuned in to the Rico Report. I really don't know what to tell you. That game was insane. That game was insane. Was insane. Welcome to the Big Squad. Shout out to the Big Squad. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Big Squad. Welcome on a very special evening to the Rico Report. We are here. This is the Buffalo Fanatics. Bing, 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 bing. bing, bing, bing. <laughs>